This happened to a group of three friends during their weekend outing. Early in the morning, Pan had driven his car to Zun's house. This guy was always sluggish. Pan had waited more than 20 minutes for the guy to get ready. And of course, right the moment Zun walked out of his house, he was scolded severely by his friend. But Zun couldn't break his bad habit of being a slow coach, and it took him then another 10 minutes to finally hit the road. There was also another guy named Leo who was in the car with them. He was always chosen to be the driver for the group. As Pan loved sleeping while the car moved on the road, Zun was completely opposite of him as he never sat still. The destination was a mountainous area located not too far away from the city. This time they visited a sacred pagoda. Less than two hours later the three of them had finally arrived at the destination. The area was quiet and unspoiled as the clean and fresh air made them feel extremely comfortable. It had been a long time for the group of three friends to travel together. Needless to say, they were extremely excited as they started climbing soon as they got off the car. They talked enthusiastically to each other while making their way to the pagoda. It only took them a short time to get halfway up the mountain, but it wasn't an easy task to get through the other half of the mountain though. Come on guys, we're almost there, Pan said. It was safe to say that Zun was not only the slowest person out of the three, but also the weakest. Uh, slow down guys, Zun said in his tired voice. Pan grumbled as he heard his friend calling him. He stopped midway, waited for the slow poke to keep up with him. After an hour of walking, they eventually reached the pagoda's gate. The gate was made of stones, looking pretty old as the words engraved on it had been blurred. Zun was completely wiped out as soon as he arrived. Meanwhile, Pan and Leo couldn't hide the excitement on their faces. The pagoda had a unique design as it looked antiquely. There's one thing worth mentioning here. Zun was a bragger on social media. He quickly reached to his phone and took pictures of everything he saw at the pagoda. He even took selfies next to the statues, which was very offensive of him to do it at a sacred place like this. But Zun seemingly didn't realize how disrespectful he was as he just fixed his eyes on the phone screen. While picking out the best picture out of the ones he had taken in order to post it on Facebook, Zun instantly got startled to see a hand placed on his shoulder. Turned out there was an abbot standing behind him. He was dissatisfied with the guy's inappropriate behavior. The abbot pointed at Zun. His face changed color as he said, Please be careful with your action. This is a sacred place. Picture taking is forbidden under any circumstance. Zun was extremely annoyed. He expressed his anger by saying the abbot was a selfish person for not letting him take pictures. He was also told to delete the ones he had taken to avoid having troubles. Of course, with a guy who was as stubborn as a mule like Zun, he wouldn't easily give in. As Zun walked away, the abbot hey. still followed him and demanded the guy to remove the pictures as it would be very dangerous if he insisted on keeping them. Seeing the abbot speaking loudly and the annoyed expression on Zun's face, the two companions were surprised as they believed their friend had caused trouble again. Pan went to the abbot and asked him what happened. As he fully understood the situation, he apologized to the monk and told Zun to delete the pictures immediately. Zun expressed his annoyance and he walked away. The two other friends shook their heads in disappointment as they hadn't even prayed to the gods yet. When they got in their car, Pan once again told Zun to remove the photos but got completely ignored. As the group continued their journey, they drove down to town and booked a hotel to stay the night. That night, Zun was laying on his bed, busy picking out the best photos to get them posted on his Facebook page. However, Zun suddenly acted bizarrely as he instantly sat up. But his action was not the only thing odd as he also had a serious expression on his face. Zun felt like there was something wrong with the photos. It was unknown how, but his selfie pics had become mysteriously blurred. Even some of them were so badly displayed that he couldn't recognize himself in them. Not only one, but most of his selfies had been blurred. 
Initially, the guy thought there must have been something wrong with the camera, so he took a picture to check. But the photo was completely normal as there wasn't anything blurred in it. Zam then opened the front camera and took a selfie. He instantly got startled by the photo he'd just taken. His face was deformed and blurry. Feeling scared, he told his two friends about it. As Leah was drifting into sleep, he was awakened by Zan's voice as a guy was knocking on the door. It looked like he was losing his patience to get a convincing explanation for what had happened to him. How spooky it is! The selfies I'd taken at the pagoda somehow had my face totally blurred in them. Do you think there's something wrong with my phone? Leo couldn't go back to sleep after he heard the story from his friend. He told Zan to hand him the phone and got completely confused afterwards. Leo had no idea how the selfies had ended up being like that. After thinking for a while, they decided to go to Pan's room to tell him about the incident. It was Pan's idea to go to the pagoda so he must know a thing or two about this place. Pan's face became dark as he saw the pictures. Even though the group of friends had been to many places, some of those were the mysterious and unspoiled but it was their first time to encounter such a scary thing. According to Pan, the pagoda was a sacred and mystical place so there must be a high chance that Zan had been punished for his disrespectful behavior. Zan didn't sleep that night. He couldn't close his eyes as he imagined the terrifying scenario that would happen to him in the near future. As the three friends were deprived of sleep last night, they looked worried and fatigued. Before heading back to their home, they decided to go to the bakery to have a belly full and to get their mood lightened up. Since it was a popular bakery in town, there was no table left for them. As a result, the three friends had to sit on a table with a stranger. Little did they know that there was a group of thugs holding weapons aggressively approaching their table. Just a few seconds later, a fight had broken out. The man in a blue shirt who sat at their table was a debtor, and those ferocious thugs were here to collect his debt. Even though Zan had no intention of stopping the fight, a thug unexpectedly shifted his focus and attacked him. The thug stabbed Zan in the stomach. It happened so fast that both Leo and Pan were completely ignorant of the situation their friend got in. Blood was splashed as Zan collapsed on the ground. Leo and Pan instantly panicked with the help of the bakery owner. They got an ambulance to rush the man to the hospital. As Zan had been taken to the hospital in time, he was saved by the doctors. After the surgery, Zan had fainted for a day. Leo and Pan took turns to take care of their friend. As Zan finally regained his consciousness, the first thing he saw was two of his closest friends by his side. Pan looked at Zan and said, I believe you have learned your lesson from this incident. Take this as a warning and don't you ever take photos at a mystical place again. As the man finished his sentence, he took out Zan's phone, then took a picture. Pan later told his friend that he and Leo had went to the pagoda again and asked the abbot to remove the curse from him. The photo which had been blurred before now turned to normal. It's safe to say that from now on, Zun would never dare to take a photo again. Exchanging the heart for tofu. This story was told by the elders some years ago. It was said that there was a restaurant in the village that served tofu. According to an old proverb, the three hardest jobs in the world were boat building, iron forging and tofu making because you had to get up every day at 2 a.m. in the morning to start. To grind the soybeans, heat the soy milk and finally press it into tofu was a hard job. Then, before dawn, you would have to cycle through the caves and alleys to sell it. 
Tofu sellers peddled the streets until someone bought from them. Their tofu was outstanding. But there was a problem that buyers always had. A problem of underweight tofu. A peddler adjusted it on the scale and it looked like it was enough when weighed. But each scale was missing 100 grams or even 200. Sometimes a few careful buyers would bring it back to weigh again. Later, when they found out that their tofu was underweight, they asked why, and they also said that sometimes the tofu lost its weight due to transportation or weather. Obviously lack of credibility, but buyers were often afraid of trouble, so they didn't say too much. Everyone had their own reason. Then, generously paying a part of the compensation or adding another piece of tofu. Anyone who made contact with him thought that he was easy to talk to. He had been in that business for 10 years. It was also said that if you go for a walk by the river with no shoes on, you should not get wet. And for this tofu seller, something wasn't right either. Every day he got up early, even though he felt sleepy, he still rode his bicycle and got lost in the deserted forest near the village. He was dozing until someone called to buy tofu and suddenly he had to wake up. At the time an old woman came out of the forest and said she wanted to buy tofu. He didn't even think about how an old woman appeared out of nowhere and would buy only two pounds of tofu. Doing as the old woman said, he cut a piece of tofu. According to his calculations, the piece of tofu weighed two pounds but could be called the heaviest. He added another piece, but it still didn't weigh enough. While two large pieces of tofu weighed four or five pounds, he was wondering if the scale might be wrong. But the old woman decided to say something shocking to him. Only then did he realize what was happening, but it was too late, because the old woman suddenly appeared with long fingers and nails, which she inserted into his chest and ripped out his heart. Then the old woman bent down again to pick up a stone. She threw it straight into his chest and said she would see until he stopped deceiving others and change his conscience. Only then would his heart grow back automatically as he was in so much pain and fear that he creaked for a few hours and then passed out. He didn't even know how long he had been lying on the ground, but when he woke up, he couldn't see the old woman anywhere. There were no wounds on his body, and his heart was in excruciating pain. He looked into the forest where the old lady had come from. Except for a few ghosts, there couldn't be anyone else. As he took his bicycle to go back home, he had to endure the pain. When he got home, he instantly fell sick as he laid on the bed. He gradually lost his memory and his mouth was painful. The sickness stayed with him for almost half a month. However, he said that after he would change his conscience so that he wouldn't lie to others anymore and the pain in his heart would gradually heal. That day he knew he would have to change his way of doing things to ensure a healthier future. Shen and I have been close friends since we were children, and one day while we were playing, I senselessly asked about Shen's family. Because the Shen family was the wealthiest in the area as a result of selling tofu for many generations, Shen stated that his great-grandfather Jin started his career without any resources, and there was a thrilling story that had been passed down in the Shen family until now. Shen then began telling me the story. He also told me not to tell anyone about the story, which piqued my interest even more. Shen's great-grandfather, Jin, worked as a hired worker for other people when he was young, 
His life was very difficult and poor. Jin's daily job was simply mowing the lawn or doing other jobs that people hired him for. Jin married after a while as well. Soon after, they had a child and that was now Shen's grandfather. Because life was too difficult, Jin devised a business plan to help his family. He saved up and purchased a bag of fresh soybeans. His business plan based on a tofu recipe taught by Jin's mother in the past. He ground these beans to get water. Back in the day, people cooked milk with soybeans mainly. With Jin's heirloom recipe, the bean paste quickly solidified into a large, soft mass that looked very delicious. Jin initially offered to sell to local households, but because they were unfamiliar with the food, they only bought a little at a time. When they returned home, they could make many different delicious and nutritious dishes with the tofu and Jin's tofu gradually gained popularity. People in the area began to come to Jin for more purchases. Jin suggested to his wife that they open a small shop for business as their business grew better and better. Because their business was going well, because their business was doing well, people from other areas frequently came to place orders and Jin would deliver the tofu to them. Jin was completing an order as usual one day. He needed to transport the tofu to the next village, so Jin woke up early to prepare to go. Because there were no other modes of transportation available at the time, everything was transported by road. But when he arrived, the customer's house was closed and there appeared to be no one living in there, so Jin returned. The couple felt strange, but what concerned them more was that the tofu couldn't be stored for long especially this was almost all of their tofu for today. But instead of giving up, Jin decided to carry the tofu around and sell it, as well as visit other villagers to see if anyone would buy it. So Jin carried the tofu to go once more. It was getting dark now. Jin had gone for a long time but only sold a few of the tofu, and seeing that it was already dark, he was disappointed and was about to return. Jin then noticed from a distance a very large and extremely busy restaurant with many customers coming in and out. Jin was taken aback by how deserted the area was, but this restaurant was doing exceptionally well. Jin turned to leave when he heard a voice calling him from behind. Jin quickly turned hey. around when he noticed the restaurant owner beckoning from a distance. Jin walked over to see what he needed. The owner then offered to buy all of Jin's tofu. Jin was taken aback. Why would a stranger offer to buy himself a whole basket of tofu? Hello, I'm a friend of your mother and I heard your tofu is delicious. Just leave it all to me, said the owner. Accompanied by an invitation to join them for dinner because his restaurant was hosting a party to commemorate a special occasion today, but Jin refused, stating that all he needed to do was carry the tofu inside and return. The owner did not force him at this time. He simply told Jin to carry the tofu to the kitchen and then he could leave. Jin followed the owner inside the large house and went straight to the kitchen. The owner put his hand on Jin's shoulder just as he was about to turn around, intending to keep Jin. He explained that he wanted to invite Jin to dinner to show his admiration. Also the way back was a bit long and it was already dark and he saw Jin was very tired. Jin still refused, citing the fact that his family was waiting for him at home. However, the owner was still ecstatic and pushed Jin to the table. Jin was pushed to a dining table with the owner's enthusiasm and what was in front of him surprised Jin. Because there was such a feast in front of Jin right now, full of fish and meat, which were cooked very attractively, Jin couldn't resist the enticing scent of the food after carrying tofu for the whole afternoon and being exhausted as well. Seeing the increasing number of customers entering the restaurant, 
Jen initially planned to eat briefly and then leave. Jen devoured a chicken thigh because such a hearty meal was normally difficult to have. Jen looked around for a while of attentive eating and noted something was wrong. Jen looked at the people next to him. They didn't talk at all and they didn't even eat. He took the initiative to start a conversation, but they did not respond. Jen reasoned that they didn't like him because he didn't pay for the meal. Looking back, the restaurant's owner was seated with other customers. Jin was a little embarrassed because he had been invited to eat such delicious food like this for free. As a result, Jin decided to bring a cup of tea to the next table to toast with the owner to thank for treating him so well. Jin attempted to speak and thank him when he arrived, but the owner did not respond. He was sitting still, neither eating nor responding to Jin. Jin noticed something odd and asked if the owner thought he was a jerk because he ate without paying. But no matter how many times he asked, the owner sat motionless. Jin took the initiative to call him because he thought it was too weird. But as soon as he walked over to touch the owner, Jin was startled by what he saw. All of the dishes on the table in front of the owner and his guests there was no meat or fish at all, only worms and maggots on the plates. And they were still alive, crawling around on the plates and on the table. Other foods were simply soil and worms. Jin panicked at this point and the owner slowly turned around. Jin screamed in terror when a skull full of maggots appeared. Jin was so terrified and panicked. He took a step back and attempted to flee, but tripped. Jin fainted after his head hit the ground, and he had no idea what had happened. Not sure how long Jin was unconscious, but when he awoke, he saw a large crowd in front of him. He opened his eyes slowly to see better. It turned out to be his wife and some close neighbors. Jin was still in shock and was about to tell his wife what he had witnessed. The old man who lived next door quickly stopped him, preventing Jin from speaking. After that, everyone pitched in to help Jin get out of the woods. After that, everyone told Jin that because it was late at night and he hadn't returned, his wife had called some neighbors to look for him. After a while searching around, everyone found Jin lying next to a grave. With his mouth full of mud, Jin heard it and was perplexed. Had he met ghosts? Jin quickly put his hand in his pocket after recalling that they had paid him. Jin took out a bunch of dried leaves. Jin dashed over to check the tofu load because he remembered selling the tofu to those ghosts and they used the tofu in a variety of delicious dishes. And when he opened it, there was no longer any tofu inside. So what happened to the tofu in the end? Jin's family was very concerned about him after what happened, but Jin insisted that he was fine. Jin simply stated that he was tired and needed to rest. Jin vomited a lot after that because of what he ate, and everything Jin vomited up was mud mixed with tofu. Jin eventually stopped delivering and began to open a restaurant, serving dishes with tofu as the main course. The strange thing was that after that day, Jin's tofu suddenly became more popular and customers were lining up every day. Surprisingly, the idea of opening a tofu restaurant made Jin's business much more convenient. Jin's tofu had almost gotten everyone addicted and crazy. Jin believed he got this idea from his ghost encounter. Soon after, Jen's restaurant appeared like a kite in the wind and it was soon able to expand into a large store and Jen became increasingly wealthy. After hearing Shen's story, I began to have strange thoughts. That the tofu pieces my parents bought from the Shen family, which I ate every day, had anything to do with the bugs or the things Jen went through that night.
It occurred in 2013 while I was a student. There is a fairly clear river right next to the hostel where we live. We're all from the country and we've been swimming in rivers since we were kids so when we saw this one we knew we had to jump in. Aniko quickly undressed and began wading into the water. This individual appears to be looking forward to revisiting his childhood memories. Kane and I both went into the water shortly after. The river in the city isn't as clear and cool as the river in the country, but it still makes us happy. We swam for a while before starting to play in the water like we did in the country. If anyone happened to pass by, they'd probably think we had some kind of mental illness. There is a bridge near the river. Although bathing near the bridge would have been cooler, we never went because there was an underground current under the bridge that was dangerous. That day, I noticed someone swimming beneath the bridge. Aniko approached intrigued by my surprised expression and inquired as to what I was looking at. I stated that I saw someone swimming beneath the bridge. That area is extremely dangerous. If you slip, you could lose your life. After hearing this, Aniko and Kane became concerned as well, so the three of them looked at the water beneath the bridge at the same time. After a long period of observation, we determined that it was a girl. She on the other hand remained stationary and did not move. I couldn't see her face because it was so dark under the bridge. All I could see was her long hair floating in the water. Because Aniko and Kane suspected I was spying on the girl, they urged me to come over and strike up a conversation. I have a crush on a girl with long hair, but I can't talk to her naked. The three of us swam in the river until the sun went down before getting back. Before going back to the inn, I looked under the bridge to see if the long-haired girl was still there. For some reason, it was already getting dark, but she hasn't landed. However, I quickly left because I was afraid the girl would think I was sneaking around. Because the weather was still hot the next day, the three of us planned to go to the river to swim off to school. Because it was extremely hot, I entered the water before Aniko this time. The two boys quickly dressed up and chased them down. But as soon as I stepped into the water, I noticed the long-haired girl I saw under the bridge the day before. Not only was I taken aback by the girl's appearance, but so were Aniko and Kane. This piqued everyone's interest. The long-haired girl from yesterday swam in only in one position and didn't even look back. Swim, but all three of us had the impression that the other girl was floating in the water. Aniko, who was always cheerful, began to be concerned. He didn't think this girl enjoyed swimming so much that she spent two days in the river. Kane also spoke up at this point. He had the impression that it was just a human head floating in the water. But Aniko and I both thought it was impossible because the water under the bridge was moving so quickly. If it had been a human head that couldn't stay put, it could have been swept away. After some deliberation, Kane came to the conclusion that it is best if we go under the bridge to find out what the truth is. Aniko and I both agreed on this point so we made the decision to approach the other girl. Because I was the best swimmer of the three of us, I led the way to the fast water just to be safe. I couldn't see her face very well because it was quite dark under the bridge. All I could see was her very long hair and snow white skin. I was afraid to approach her for fear of upsetting her. I only dared to stand back and try to call and ask from some distance. She did not respond but instead slowly turned her head to follow the flowing water and what happened right after that was truly terrifying. What we've seen since yesterday is a human head and it's starting to decompose. Maggots are crawling from the eye sockets, nose and mouth. I screamed in terror and backed away slowly. Aniko and Kane who were swimming alongside were both terrified. We three panicked and swam ashore where we immediately called the police who arrived to investigate the incident. It turned out that the head was tied to a large rock which prevented it from moving at all. We were returned from some interrogation as a group of three. Aniko, Kane and I skipped dinner that night unable to swallow the maggots crawling all over the girl's face. Perhaps because we were too shocked and tired to sleep that night we all went to bed early but the fear on our faces could not be hidden. That night, Kane and Aniko both had the same strange dream.
this appears to be what the other girl was attempting to convey to us. We fantasized about the river road. It was evening and a girl with long hair was riding a bicycle. Suddenly, a dark figure leapt from the shore's grass and charged towards her. The girl screamed in terror but no one heard her. To avoid everyone's gaze, the shadow pushed the long-haired girl and a bicycle into the grass. He used his hand to strangle the girl until the girl could no longer resist. I don't know what his purpose is to act like that. After killing the girl, the man tied her up and placed a body on the back of the bicycle. He then walked towards a water tower by the river, wondering what this perverted murderer was going to do with the poor girl's body. Looks like this isn't the first time he's killed someone. He calmly carried the girl's body to the top of the water tower. Then he put the girl down and stared at her body like he was contemplating his booty. After observing for a while, he bent down to pick up a large rock from the ground. Involuntarily, a mysterious smile appeared on his face. With an amused expression on his face, he used all of his strength to repeatedly throw the large stone at the girl's body. After the girl was dead, he broke her neck, severed her head and placed her head in a black bag. He looked down at the river and chose the section with the fastest current. He then dumped the poor girl's head into the water. He tied the head with a large stone to prevent it from floating away. In the dream, I appeared to have transformed into that girl and I felt myself falling into a stream of cold water. Through the water, I could even see the man's evil face. After committing so many sinful acts, he smiled contently. I tried to wake up because that dream was causing me so much pain as if I were a victim for myself. Everyone was drenched in sweat from the fear by this point. As soon as I opened my eyes, I noticed a swarm of maggots on my pillow. They confused me as to whether this was real or a dream. I immediately jumped up, panicked and held because I was disgusted and nauseated. At this point, I realized that I was not the only one who had been awakened in this manner. Both Aniko and Kane are wearing the same expressions as me. Not only that, but the floor of the hostel is now full of water, much like the scene in my hometown on heavy rainy days. But this is the seventh floor of the dormitory. It was hard to believe. There are still long hairs floating on the floor's water, and we have no idea where they came from. I was curious, so I asked Aniko and Kane why they had gotten up so early. Their response made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. They wished for a girl like me. We've all had the same dream. The more I thought about it, the more terrified I became. So we went to the police station together and tracked down the officer who had questioned us that day. He didn't believe what we were saying, but luckily this cop was still in charge of the case. So he drove us down the river to see if he could locate the water tower we were discussing. There was indeed a water tower by the river, not far from where we used to swim. These water towers appear to have been abandoned for a long time. They are quite old with many cracks on the outside. We drove past three water towers in a row but none of them resembled the ones we saw in our dreams. The cop was getting frustrated because we couldn't figure out which tower it was so he offered to drive us home. I, Kane and Aniko were all perplexed but I still believe it's not a coincidence that all three of us had the same dream. Just as we were about to give up, Kane, who was sitting in the back seat yelled and pointed out the window. When we looked in the direction he indicated, we found a ruined water tower just like in our dreams. So the cop and the three of us approached the water tower to observe, hoping to find clues to the case. The volunteer cop led the way with the three of us trailing behind. Strange things happen in quick succession and we gradually lost our courage. As we got closer to the water tower, a strong stench rose up, making everyone want to vomit. The cop asked us to wait below while he climbed alone to inspect the top of the water tower. A headless girl's body was found above the water tower. Then a large number of police and forensic officers arrived. I had an indescribable feeling when we were back in the police car, looking at the poor girl's body being brought down from the water tower. 
Although this incident was reported in the newspaper, we have always kept this strange dream a secret. This is a scary story that I was told by my father. It happened to him when he was young. That day my father together with his other colleague went to see a mutual friend of theirs. The three of them had drunken excessively. As it struck midnight my father said his farewell to the other two men. One of them accompanied my dad to the gate and told him to be careful along the way. As my dad was walking on the familiar street, he realized it looked a bit strange and more unusual than it had normally been. He took a deep breath, then went into the pitch darkness. The gusts of wind gave my father a comfortable feeling as he made his way back home. A while later, my father went to a three-way junction. He looked confused at the roads ahead of him, then decided to take a shortcut. As he kept walking, he suddenly realized that in order to get home, he had to get through a forest. As he made his way deeper into the forest, he stepped onto the dead leaves on the ground, which created a sound that echoed throughout the whole place. My dad kept walking and walking, without caring much about what was going on around him. However, there was something strange here. Why was there too much fog in the forest? At that time, the wind was blowing lightly and the atmosphere was eerily scary. My dad finally sobered for a moment. He took a look around and found out that he was in the middle of a dense forest. There was no light at all. Suddenly he heard a noise. My dad went to the direction of the noise as he slowly walked there to see what was going on. A group of men was seen gathering, singing and dancing cheerfully as they sat in a circle. Out of curiosity my father walked to the group and held. Hey, I want to join you guys. My dad had a passion for singing and dancing as he never missed out a chance to participate in these kind of activities. That was the reason why he asked him to let him join in with an excited look on his face. The drunkness made him even more enthusiastic. He danced with a group of strangers all night and didn't even bother to go home. When it was nearly morning, my father had fully sobered. He instantly realized there was something not right taking place here. The scene before his eyes had changed. My dad had seen the group of men dancing around him suddenly becoming disfigured, which made them all look like monsters. As my dad rubbed his eyes constantly, he became even more terrified to see the things appearing in front of him. The shape of the people here became even more disfigured. Their faces looked lifeless. They walked very slowly as if they were floating off the ground. They were also seen stammering, but the sound coming out of their mouths was haunting. All of a sudden, a guy had his head twisted around, which looked incredibly creepy. Their dance moves had also changed as they were way more creepy. My dad was completely bewildered. He tried to escape, but the ghosts didn't let him leave as they surrounded him in a circle. My dad screamed out in fear. He pushed his way through the crowd and ran away, leaving the ghosts behind, trying to grab him. As it was getting dark, my dad slowly realized that he had been lost. What was even more terrifying? The tall mighty trees unexpectedly got twisted. They didn't even look realistic, which scared the hell out of him. The sudden thoughts popped into my dad's mind, making him feel dizzy. A total new world had appeared before his very eyes, one that was scary and spooky. Then my father caught himself standing in the middle of a maze of roads. He panicked. Not knowing which road to take, he thought to himself that he was being tricked by the ghosts in this forest. Sweat poured down his face as he tried to step forward. But his steps unknowingly became heavy as he walked sluggishly as if he had been exhausted. The atmosphere in the forest also became scorching hot. The high temperature worn him out as his face turned pale and dripped with sweat. A few moments later, he felt numb throughout his whole body. All of a sudden, my father felt giddy, as if he had no strength left in his body. He slowly closed his eyes and confusedly walked forward. The trees
tree leaves fluttering in the breeze, the things appearing before his eyes became dark and blurry in the night fog. My dad was scared. He tried to regain his consciousness while finding a way to get out of the spooky forest. But no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't even get up on his own. Things started getting more and more blurry. My dad was no longer aware of anything around him as he slowly fainted. The next morning, my dad was awoken by the sunlight shining down the forest. He slowly opened his eyes and saw two men staring at him. With a worried expression on their faces, the men asked if my dad was okay and asked how he ended up in this forest. A while later, my father had fully regained his consciousness. There were scratches all over his body. He couldn't even lay on his side as he faced his face onto the ground due to fatigue. As the smell of alcohol emanated from my father, the two men could guess that he had got lost on the way home due to drunkenness. They lifted him up and offered to take him home. As they made their way out of the place, my dad turned around and gazed at the forest. He recalled what had happened to him while the questions on his mind still remained unanswered. Later my father found out that there was this one particularly scary flower that was called by the name ghostly grass. In this forest, the flower could cause hallucinations to those who got exposed to it. At night, it emitted a smell causing the one who breathed it in to hallucinate. The woodcutters also saw things being deformed as they went to the forest at night. After the incident, neither did my dad dare to get wasted nor go to the forest late at night. It still haunted him to this day as he still forbids me to go to the forest. As a child, I lived in the countryside for a while and heard many ghost stories. I myself had seen ghosts a few times. However, I couldn't say I had seen ghosts with anyone because it was still very mysterious to me. In my days of going to elementary school, I once saw a ghost while crossing a small bridge. That day my friend and I were joking around, so we decided to go under the bridge. Here, I experienced a rather strange phenomenon. There were three fourth grade girls there. One knelt on the ground and repeatedly slapped her cheek, and the other two stood aside with a somewhat worried look on their faces. I quickly went over to ask what they were performing. I also realized that the girl kneeling was Hen, living in the same neighborhood as myself. When I saw it clearly, I realized that these girls weren't joking. Hen's cheeks were slapped until puffy and her face black. I found it strange that anyone would beat themselves so cruelly. The other two girlfriends were dumbfounded, did not act and did not intervene, which made me curious. It turned out they couldn't stop. It was like people who were glued to the ground. Seeing that I walked over and pulled Hen up. But it seemed that the goal was very strong, even stronger than an adult. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't pull her up. I often heard stories about being possessed by demons, so I knew this girl was not fine. I quickly ran to the girl's house to ask for help. I told her parents about what happened. Likewise, after her parents arrived, they couldn't stop Hen from slapping herself. So the mother asked the rest of them what happened. The girls both cried and sniffled. In that late afternoon when the children were walking together, Hen wanted to take a break. She went to a lawn by the embankment for convenience. The other two girls did not feel anything and after waiting for a while, Hen went out. But ever since Hen returned from the lawn, she kept her head down without saying a word. After walking a few steps, the girl suddenly fell to the ground with a strong thud. Then she started slapping herself. The two of her friends tried to stop it but couldn't and didn't understand why she was acting like that. 
The matter was clarified after Hen's mother returned to the village and found a woman with experience in exorcism in the countryside. She was a person who could exterminate demons. Although she was not a witch, she could also drive away demons. And when Hen arrived, the older woman was still holding a bowl. She walked up to Hen and suddenly threw water in her face. When the water spilled, I knew what kind of water was in the bowl. After that, Hen fell to the ground. Her parents took her home to rest for a week before going back to school. The older woman also warned us that under the bridge, there were a lot of unjust souls. If we ever got near that area, we should not speak any dirty words or act rudely, lest we be the same again. Someone said that in the past, on that spot, there was an untimely death. The man was a builder, but he was always drunk while working. That day he did not come back from work, but at night he slept on the pile of materials. The two other workers immediately came to shake him up and discovered that he was already dead. The reason for the death was being drunk. It sounded absurd, but it was true. He still held an empty bottle of wine in his hand and had no wounds on his body. The people in the village thought that the man died because of the wind. Seeing that this victim came from another place to live there temporarily without relatives, he was buried in the embankment field. There was no one to worship and clean the area, so soon this tomb was overgrown with grass. The place where Hen went to the bathroom was the same place where the tomb was placed. There was another story also related to that tomb. That day, when I was doing my homework, my aunt ran over to ask if my father had seen her husband going anywhere. My father saw that my aunt was worried and he ran out to find her husband and I also followed curiously. We asked around the village if anyone had seen my uncle but to no avail. Then we ran to the little shop and they said that my uncle had bought a lot of alcohol and left the village. The strange thing was that my uncle was not a drinker at all. My father and aunt found the path leading to the tunnel from the owner's instructions. Normally when coming home from work, my uncle would never go this way, so no one thought that he would be there. And then we were all surprised to find him in that place. He was lying on the edge of the rock, seemingly drunk and unconscious. Next to him were a few bottles and dishes. My uncle was taken to the hospital for treatment. Fortunately, he was saved in time, so everyone was okay. But when people asked my uncle why he went to that place to drink, he did not know anything. But everyone understood that this story was related to the man who died while building the bridge. Up to now, that place had been reclaimed and repaired and the tomb had been moved, so everything was peaceful. But these stories I still remembered vividly and used to scare the naughty or destructive children in the family and the neighborhood. The scary story happened to a guy named Tengu. Every late afternoon, some of the old people gathered in groups of five or seven under the village's top banyan tree to play chess. Tengu was also at the chess game at that time, as he observed and commented. Tengu was the type of person that no one wanted to meet. He wandered around the village all day, and he teased everyone he met. He made many people feel uncomfortable. Originally, in a village, he was a thug. He did not research anything, hence before everyone's reaction, he immediately rolled his eyes and did not respect anyone. The village leader was furious, and he ordered that Tengu be punished for offending others. As a result, he simply left. 
Eastall tried to turn his head and sneered a few more phrases with a tone that everyone suggested he had spent playing chess for a long time. In his free time he had nothing to do. Dingo asked people to join in playing cards. He must be a gambling addict. Because everyone knew Tengu didn't have money in his pocket, no one would allow him to play. Even among them, some individuals looked down their noses at Tengu and just gave him a fleeting glance before walking away. While they played cards, they talked about an ancient tomb, the tomb located in the western forest. In the tomb, there was a big fox. The fur of the fox was worth thousands of gold. Whoever found this fox would be rich. Tengu immediately showed great interest when he heard the story. However, the western forest was a dangerous place. Tengu seemed unconcerned about the threat. He eventually located the tomb that the others had indicated after more than 30 minutes of trekking. The tomb appeared to have been there for a long time. Even the inscription on the stele had faded and couldn't be read. Because he thought the tomb must have a big fox in it, Tengu patiently hid at the foot of a tree and waited from afternoon until nightfall. Suddenly Tengu looked surprised, as if he couldn't believe what he was seeing. It was exactly as they said. A red fox had appeared from underneath the tomb. Tengu couldn't hide his joy when he saw the size and fur of the fox. Tengu had never seen any red fox before. If he caught it, he would have a great treasure to sell. The fox appeared to notice that it was being followed. With the ghostly eyes, it returned the stare. Tengu couldn't sleep at night because he couldn't get his mind off the fox. He spent all night to prepare the necessary supplies to trap the fox. Early in the next morning, Tengu went into the forest and carried his handmade trap prepared from last night. After setting a trap, he hid behind a tree. He held a large stick and waited. Tengu fell asleep due to the rapid passage of time. Tengu was finally awakened by groaning after a lengthy sleep. He cheerfully looked and anxiously awaited the results of his rope trap. Indeed, the fox was trapped. The fox's one leg was tangled in the rope. No matter how hard the fox struggled, the fox couldn't get out. Tengu immediately had the opportunity to carry the stick and rushed out as quickly as he could. He intended to kill the fox with one blow of his stick. He swung down his stick and shot right at the fox without hesitation. The powerful blow struck the fox's hind leg it caused the fox to splatter blood, but it also broke the rope. The fox seized the opportunity and dashed towards the lair beneath the tomb with the last of her remaining strength. Tengu tried to keep up, but he couldn't. It was deep and dark inside, and the cave's entrance was narrow, so there was no way to catch her. Outside, Tengu can only be irritated because there was nothing he could do. He slammed his hand against his thigh, his face flushed with regret because he was only a few steps away from possessing a great treasure. He walked away with a stick, but his ambition remained. He was well aware that the fox had been seriously injured and would be unable to move. He'll be back the next day. Tingu couldn't sleep that night because he didn't eat anything all day and came home to find no rice left. He felt hungry. On the other hand, he was worried that the fox would be taken away by others, so he kept tossing and turning. Then, before dawn, Tengu carried his stick into the forest in order to hunt down the fox with a beautiful fur. However, on the way to the grave, Tengu happened to notice a small house in the middle of the murky forest. He'd never heard of people living in the forest before. Furthermore, every time he passed by, he didn't see such a house. 
the house emitted a bright light, and the longer he looked at it, the more he felt an invisible attraction. As a result, the young man approached with curiosity and excitement. Tengu peered through the window to see if anyone was inside. Then his eyes glowed with surprise and lust. At that moment, inside the house, there was a beautiful young woman who was bathing in a tub full of water. Furthermore, the girl, after discovering Tengu, turned her back to perform some seductive actions in order to invite him in. He couldn't say no to this invitation, obviously. Without a doubt, he opened the door and walked into the house. The delinquent rushed over and extended his hand to the young woman, who stood up and covered her body with a towel. His mouth was drooling and his eyes were shining as if he was contemplating a treasure. Tengu was now unable to control his actions. He took off his shirt and embraced the girl. But then, the main door was opened and a group of strange young men who were wielding weapons stormed in. Tengu was quickly subdued by the young boys who tied his hands and feet so tightly that even if he grew wings, he would be unable to flee. After that, they dragged Tengu out into the forest and tied him to a large tree without giving any knowledge of why. It was almost as if everything was pre-planned. Tengu couldn't think much at that point. He could only cry and plead for his life, but to no avail. One of them, who appeared to be enraged, walked over with a large wooden stick, placed it on the criminal's head and growled with wide eyes. He didn't say anything. He raised his stick to gain momentum before slamming Tengu in the shin with a powerful blow. There was a cracking sound as his leg was broken. Tengu's eyes were wide and the sound from his mouth rang out in the forest. He was engulfed in excruciating pain. Tengu had already passed out, and by morning he collapsed as he was still tied to a large tree. Fortunately, a hunter came across him and brought him to the village for treatment. Tengu could no longer walk normally after the night, and he might have to rely on crutches for the rest of his life. Tengu had a feeling his broken leg was related to the red fox. A week later, Tengu decided to return to the forest, to the location where he had seen the strange house to discover the truth. Indeed, when he arrived, the house was nowhere to be found. Only a group of wild foxes were running around. It seemed that it was possibly the revenge of the fox elf herself. Captain Chao was summoned urgently that morning. He rushed to the headquarters. It was too crowded in the morning to get from the dormitory to the headquarters, so he couldn't take a cab. He had to run, which made him sweat a lot. Everyone could see that there was a serious case that required Captain Chao's attention, which was why he was in such a hurry. And as expected, as soon as he walked into the office, Boss Lu Feng asked him to lead some people to the end of the town. Captain Chao wanted to learn more about the case so that it could be handled efficiently. According to the village newspaper, there had been many disappearances and murders in recent days, said boss Lu Feng. Oh, uh, was it because of a wild animal? Captain asked. 
According to reports, the culprit was the ghost of an elderly woman and her cat. This surprised the captain because despite having seen many strange cases, the ghost of an old woman and a cat could kill people still very shockingly. People were currently confused because it was a remote village. People believed the police wouldn't care, so they might act quickly to assist people. When Captain Chow heard this, he immediately took orders and set off. He and his comrades went to village in casual clothes to make the quest easier. When they arrived, the village chief greeted them enthusiastically and cheerfully. The captain went straight to the point and inquired about the case. On the way, the chief told them that the story began with an old woman named Lang, and that when she died, everything had changed. She was over 70 years old this year and lived with a son and daughter-in-law, but the son frequently worked far away and the daughter-in-law frequently cursed at her. Because she was an elderly woman, she often wet her pants with urine unconsciously. The daughter-in-law was so frustrated that she had to do the laundry all day, so she yelled at her constantly. She could only keep quiet when she heard that she was too old and her living only made her children and grandchildren unhappy. The only thing that brought her comfort was her cat, what had been with her for over 10 years. She hugged the cat and went into the room that day, but she didn't go out of the room the next day. The son came home from work and heard that his mother was still in the room, so he went in to find and comfort her. He believed that his wife was just talking nonsense and that his mother didn't need to pay attention to that. He opened the door and walked in. But the scene in front of him astounded him. The old woman hanged herself in her room, probably to not burden her children. The cat, what was lying beneath her body, also stared at him angrily and hissed in a frightening manner. It then darted past him and fled. He took his mother's body down quickly and bemoaned the fact that he did not take better care of her. He cried a lot at this point because he thought he was so unfaithful that his mother had to commit suicide. But no matter how much he cried, his mother could not be revived. But it looked like his mother didn't want to die. Her eyes remained open wide and filled with hatred. Because the funeral required extensive preparations, her body was still kept in the house. That night, the wife was gathering firewood to cook. All of a sudden, she screamed out because she saw something. When the husband heard his wife screaming, he rushed to the scene. The old woman's cat died behind the firewood after being poisoned by rat poison. Suddenly, there was a loud noise coming from the room where the old woman's body was found. The son thought his mother was still alive. He was a beat. He dashed in there to check and his wife followed him. When they arrived, they were both taken aback. The mother was standing tall in front of them, as if nothing had happened. The daughter-in-law became nervous, but the son still believed his mother was alive, so he called out to her. Suddenly, the old woman turned around. Her face disfigured into that of a cat, complete with bright green eyes and fangs. When she saw the two of them, she squealed like a cat and became extremely angry. Her face looked extremely frightening. She pounced on them, her movements as quick as those of a cat. The terrified wife fled immediately, left her husband behind. Obviously this was his mother's body, so the husband had no time to react out of astonishment. She was no longer a person at this point. Looked like the other cat had entered her body, and it didn't care who the son was anymore. It immediately attacked him with its claws. She pinned him down, unable to resist, and tore all of his flesh with her cat claws. He screamed for his mother to let him go, but to no avail. The cat seemed to hate him so much that it continued to tear up his flesh. At this point, the wife bolted, screaming for help as she ran. She ran through the neighbor's house, banging on the door, hoping that someone would save her. When neighbors heard the knock on the door, they gathered to see what was going on. After hearing her story, young men in the village took up some sticks and went over to investigate. They entered the gate and called for her husband. But no one answered, so they began to take precautions. As they dug deeper into the house, they noticed bloodstains on the ground. It looked like footprints started from inside the house. When they realized this, they led one of them to guard outside while the other two went inside the house. 
The dim lighting made it difficult for them to see their surroundings, but the stench of blood was unbearable. The husband's body gradually appeared under the bright moonlight, causing them to panic. His body and face were ripped apart by deep scratches and it appeared that he was extremely terrified before he died. They were startled when they heard a loud noise outside. They all dashed out to check. They were now frozen by the scene. The old woman was sitting on the roof, but her posture was that of a cat. With a cat's face, its big mouth full of sharp teeth, it looked at everyone and then squealed ferociously. Then she fled from house to house, then vanished. Now the daughter-in-law also became insane. Chickens and ducks in the village as well as the children were being stolen. The village chief was expecting that the children would be found soon. Captain Chow stated that they would stay for two days in order to investigate the case. The village chief was overjoyed and he arranged for them to stay at the village guest home. Following that, the two of them began to split up and patrol the village at night. There were still no leads by the second night and the captain kept patrolling the area. Suddenly, he noticed someone acting suspiciously. He had his face covered and a sack in his hand. He exited from a resident's house, looked like a thief. Captain Chow immediately came forward to ask for clarification, but he didn't seem to want to answer and appeared to be scared. The captain kicked him in the back just as he was about to flee, causing him to fall. He then rushed over to restrain him and question him about his behavior. He tied the guy up and went to look inside the sack and discovered that he was the one who abducted children in the village. The captain returned the child to the family before escorting the criminal away. He heard screams and gunshots on his way back to his room. Knowing something had happened to his comrade, he quickly tied the kidnapper to a tree and fled to the site. When the captain arrived at the location and saw that his comrade had been seriously injured on the arm, he inquired about the situation. When the comrade saw the captain, he quickly informed about the situation. He noticed a person sitting in the corner while patrolling the village. When he approached the person to inquire, she suddenly turned her face. It was the old woman possessed by a cat, and she was eating a raw chicken. In the dark, her eyes glowed with a frightening green light, so he quickly pulled out his gun and asked her to surrender, but she seemed to not understand what he was saying. She threw the half-eaten chicken to his face. He reached out his hand reflexively to prevent it. She rushed to attack him at that precise moment. She was lightning fast, her nails were razor sharp and she broke his arm in deep cuts. Not allowing her to flee, the officer quickly turned around and fired a gunshot at her. The bullet struck on her right shoulder, causing her to howl in agony. Captain Chow bandaged his shady comrade and they both pursued the elderly woman. But there was no trace of her, only a pool of blood found on the ground. The captain returned to the headquarters and ordered a large number of police officers to search for her because she was injured and couldn't run far. Very soon after receiving intelligence, the police arrested and shot an elderly cat-faced woman, transporting her to the headquarters for forensic examination. Both of them, as well as boss Lu Feng, were summoned to confirm whether or not it was her. Forensic removed the white sheet and Boss Lu Feng summoned the captain and his comrade to come and identify them. Because of her frightening appearance, they could identify her just by looking at the first sight. It was a cat-faced old lady with numerous bullet wounds on her body. According to the investigation, the children were also discovered and the person who was arrested was a trafficker who had nothing to do with a cat-faced old lady. Rumors and articles about the elderly woman were widely circulated at the time. It was exaggerated so much that people still mention it years later.
In the past, in our village, it was customary that children who died would not have proper graves, while all the adults were buried according to the local customs or cremated. Even smaller children were sometimes thrown onto the mountain. We had a special mountain called Hell's Mountain, where the deceased children were thrown. It was truly terrifying as we had to pass by it every day to reach school. When I went to school with my friends, I didn't feel scared except for a few occasions when we encountered wild dogs. They would dig and eat the bodies of the deceased children, which looked horrifying. This was truly a frightening and haunting experience from my childhood. The story I want to tell happened one day when I had an evening shift at school. I was so engrossed in my work that by the time I left it was already getting dark and raining heavily. There was no one to accompany me, so I had to run home as fast as I could alone. However, as I was crossing Hal's mountain I stumbled and fell to the ground. When I got up I realized there was nothing under my feet that could have caused me to trip. As I was wondering about what just happened, I suddenly noticed someone standing behind me. It was a young man and he took the initiative to start a conversation, asking if I was okay. Then he walked home with me. On the way he asked me whose child I was. When I answered he replied that he knew my older sister and he accompanied me to the entrance of the village. Because the young man mentioned knowing my sister, I sent her a message. But after sending the message, I suddenly realized that this guy wasn't walking ahead of me, but rather he was walking behind me. So I turned around to look at that moment I was so scared that I almost wet my pants. The young man had a large gash on his face and had a terrifying smile that stretched to his ears. I was in a state of panic and quickly called my mother, then ran home as fast as I could. When I arrived home, I saw everyone anxiously awaiting for me at the front door. My parents and grandparents were worried and didn't know what had happened to me. They guided me to bed, and all I could do was cry and couldn't say anything. After a while, when I calmed down, I narrated the story about the young man I encountered under the mountain to my family. However, my family didn't know who I was talking about. It took about two or three hours until I regained my strength and got up from bed to join them for dinner. My sister had also returned from school at that time. When I saw her, I suddenly remembered that the young man mentioned knowing my sister. I sat down and recounted the afternoon incident with her. After thinking for a while, my sister remembered a classmate who had passed away. Her friend Jim was also a resident of our village, but I was too young at that time, so I had no knowledge of her friend's death. What left a deeper impression about her friend's death was when people said that a few years ago, a child named Jin, my sister's friend, and the same young man I met in the afternoon, climbed a tall tree to show off to their friends. The tree was about 10 meters high from the ground. Unexpectedly, the branch broke and Jin fell straight to the ground. The fall killed him instantly, and during the fall, his face was scratched and torn by the branches, reaching his ears. Because Jin died at a young age, he was not given a proper burial, but instead was discarded on Hal Mountain, which we used to cross on our way back home after school. Upon hearing me recount the message from the young man sent to my sister, she remembered a time when mischievous Jin snatched her hairpin and hid it. Following Jin's instructions, my father grabbed a flashlight and led my sister and me to Tiger's Mouth Rock, a large rock shaped like a tiger with its mouth open on the mountain. This rock possessed a deep crevice requiring my dad to insert his hand and inside to search for something. After fumbling around for a while, we eventually discovered the hairpin that Jin had concealed from my older sister. Even after his passing, he still desired to make amends for what he had done wrong. This story remained in my thoughts for many years, and I couldn't determine whether Jen intended to ensure my safe return home that day, or if he simply wanted to return my older sister's hairpin. Nevertheless, Jen was the finest ghost I had ever encountered.
The story occurred in a river which ran through my village. People frequently drowned in the area due to the fast and deep currents. At the time, there was a family who stood by the river, all with sad expressions, looking at the water and lamenting. The reason was that their son drowned while bathing in the river, so they sought the assistance of Mr. Kang, who specialized in retrieving dead bodies from the river. Because it has been many hours with no results, the deceased family was concerned. All of a sudden, at the precise moment, the man pointed to the water and exclaimed loudly, Come back! Come back! With the expectant eyes, the three-person family looked down at the river. They saw Mr. Kang and his wooden boat. Mr. Kang, who had a shabby and austere face, worked as a boatman on the river as well as a body picker. The victim's family was very worried and anxiously waited for Mr. Kang's wooden boat to arrive. The boat approached the shore slowly. The river was now rising, so the boat swayed, and Mr. Kang had to work hard to keep the boat afloat. Next, Mr. Kang quickly rowed to shore. When Mr. Kang's boat docked, the victim's three family members looked at the wooden boat, worried, and the mother's face was sad. There was nothing in the dugout canoe but a fishing net. With tears in her eyes, the mother asked Mr. Kang if he could retrieve her son's body, her voice filled with pain. Mr. Kang did not respond, instead quietly raising his wrist which had a rope attached to it. He stretched one end of the rope into the water while the other appeared to be tied to a heavy object and he was attempting to pull it. Mr. Kang's face became dull and solemn. He still did not open his mouth to speak, but his gaze was fixed on the river's surface. When Mr. Kang pulled the rope out of the water, a white corpse's arm was pulled out with it, shocking everyone. It turned out that Mr. Kang tied the body with a rope and dragged him to the shore. According to locals here, drowning people should not be put on the boat because it would be very unlucky. Mr. Kang remained silent as he brought the body ashore. He then turned around and returned to the boat. As the mother witnessed the pitiful scene unfolding in front of her eyes, she sobbed and screamed as she gazed at her son's corpse. Mr. Kang was used to such scenes and he rowed away calmly. Mr. Kang's boat was about to leave the dock when a man reached out and called out to him. Mr. Kang, wait! The man presented Mr. Kang with a large sum of money in exchange for Mr. Kang retrieving their son's body. Mr. Kang on the other hand refused the money and sailed away. I'm not doing this for the money. Take care of your son's funeral well. I'm leaving. Mr. Kang did not despise money. Rather a heartbreaking incident in his past had changed his mind. Previously, Mr. Kang had both rowed and caught fish in the river. If there was any dead body floating in the river, Mr. Kang would also pick it up to take advantage of some extra money. The story took place five years ago. Only Mr. Kang was famous for picking up dead bodies in the river. When the body of the victim was discovered, Mr. Kang did not immediately hand it over to the victim's family, instead allowing them to kneel and beg on the shore. Because the poor couple did not have enough money to pay Mr. Kang, they prayed and pleaded with him to reduce the price to allow them to receive their son's body. So Mr. Kang thought for a while and then lowered the price. However, the price was still too high in comparison to the poor couple's family. So the old woman cried out and begged Mr. Kang to be merciful and reduce the money for them. When confronted with the situation, the old man cried out and said, I beg you, we will pay you a little in advance. The rest we will borrow and pay you later. Having said that, both the old couple continued to bow their heads to Mr. Kang, who was still holding the rope to hang their son's body and considering the old man's suggestion. 
Mr. Kang then agreed to accept the money and delivered the body to the old couple for them to bring it back. Mr. Kang's wife died young, and the family had a daughter who married as well. Because she was concerned that her father would be alone, she would come home every weekend and took advantage of making a delicious meal for Mr. Kang. Today, having a good amount of money, Mr. Kang happily bought wine and meat ready for a delicious meal with his dear daughter. He handed his daughter the large piece of pork he was holding in his hand and told her to make the casserole. Mr. Kang's daughter was now his only source of comfort. He was overjoyed that his daughter still came here to cook for him on a regular basis. Previously, the daughter had opposed Mr. Kang's drinking, but today she not only cooked a delicious meal, but she also bought her father a bottle of good wine. Father and daughter had dinner together and told each other many amusing stories. Mr. Kang then pondered and asked his daughter, Is there anything you want to tell dad? Mr. Kang's daughter just said that she was very happy because he was always healthy and happy, but she wanted to say something that she always kept in her heart. It turned out that the daughter was always opposed to her father doing the job of picking up dead bodies for wages. The villagers claimed that Mr. Kang was dishonest when he took advantage of the unscrupulous job to make money. Mr. Kang raised his face before his daughter finished speaking. He used to hear people whispering behind his back saying such things, but now even his daughter was opposed to his work. His wife died young and he had to do everything he could to earn money to raise her. Mr. Kang didn't care what other people said, but today, hearing his daughter say that, he felt disappointed. Mr. Kang immediately stood up, enraged, and scolded his daughter for failing to sympathize with him. Mr. Kang walked out angrily after arguing with his daughter, refusing to look back even though his daughter was calling him. Mr. Kang was extremely frustrated at the time, and even his own daughter looked down on him. Mr. Kang had only taken a few steps outside when it began to rain. He felt as if God was against him. Mr. Kang walked back to the shack where he used to rest by the river in the rain. He lay in the shack with wet clothes, huddled up, and it showed that Mr. Kang was very cold and sad. He couldn't help but cry when he thought about everything that had happened and how much bitterness he had suffered. It kept raining continuously. Mr. Kang had no idea when he fell asleep. All of a sudden he vaguely heard the sound of rain outside the shack, mixed with his daughter's voice calling him. He got to his feet and looked outside where he saw his daughter standing in the rain calling to him. Mr. Kang ignored his anger when he saw his daughter soaking in the rain. Fearing that his daughter would catch a cold from the rain, he quickly ran out of the shack. Mr. Kang looked at his daughter as she stood outside in the rain knowing how much his heart ached. It was just that his daughter's behavior was a bit strange. She begged Mr. Kang to forgive her for her words earlier, and in the end she said she had to go away, so she came to see him one last time. Mr. Kang found it difficult to understand where his daughter was going as a result of these words. He was being hesitant when his daughter turned around and walked into the river. Mr. Kang rushed forward to stop her, but what he didn't expect was that his hand had already passed over his daughter's body. His hands were shaking. Standing dumbfounded, he kept calling his daughter's name. A hunch told him that his daughter had an accident and tried to come back here to see him. Mr. Kang sadly called out his daughter's name, but to no avail. The daughter went to the cold river bank. The father's heartbreaking scream was drowned out by the sound of rain, making the pain of losing a child almost interminable. From the moment Mr. Kang walked out, the daughter went along the river to find her father, but unfortunately fell into the river and drowned. From then on, Mr. Kang rode on the river to help retrieve the dead body and didn't take a penny.